Uh, so our uh, final speaker for this session is Justin Herman. Uh, Justin manages federal-wide social media programs for the General Services Administration, Office of Citizen Services, and Innovative Technologies. That's all one thing. Uh, he leads the federal social gov community of more than 600 digital engagement managers at over 140 federal agencies. Uh, Justin was recognized as one of the 15 most forward-thinking people in government by Fierce Government and by Washington Life Magazine as one of the most influ influential young leaders in Washington. So here is Justin. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, how's everyone's uh, day going so far? Everyone got coffee and stuff? Uh, as he said, my name is Justin Herman, and I am a federal public servant. I come for you today uh, from Washington, D.C., where I work at General Services Administration's Office of Citizen Services and Innovative Technologies, which is the home of all things digital in our efforts to build the governments of the 21st century. Now, our cut of it, and what I work on specifically, is digital engagement in social media. And what that is, is we have what we call the social gov community, which is almost 700 now digital engagement managers from everything from the people that you know at NASA, State Department, to the Post Office, um, Peace Corps, all working together across lines, across different mission areas in order to provide A, measurable, better services for citizens, or B, make them more cost effective uh, for people. Um, and what we'll have in this conversation today is we're going to identify a bit of the culture behind that, especially the role that millennials play. We're going to identify some of the obstacles that we face, and I'm sure that a lot of you also face, and also opportunities in which not only I'm don't think of them as opportunities, let's think of them as an invitation for us to work together uh, to overcome these things. Uh, now, so a little bit of fun facts about millennials in the federal government is that while more than 25% of the U.S. workforce are considered millennials, only 8.5% of the federal workforce is. So you think in that chance, well, that's that's pretty low, Justin. But the thing is, is what that says is there is a great amount of opportunity for people to get involved and to get in and start shaping that 21st century government. And we're going to go through some of the examples of, of things that you see, hopefully shatter some of the myths you might have about it. And also, we're going to talk about where we're going in the very near future with it. Uh, so here you go, delightful people that I work with here again. Uh, right down to, you see in the corner there, we even work with other countries. That's Australia is able to come in through Google Hangouts outs to work on some of our things. Um, and this kind of like gives you a scope of it. Now, this is when we were meeting and we talked with the president's office of the Philippines. Now, the people surrounding him, those look like young people. That is not the, so the gentleman in the middle is the uh, spokesman for the president of the Philippines. Those are not his interns. That's the lead digital team for open data for the nation of the Philippines. Uh, and so when we say, what are the opportunities for millennials in public service, there are great leadership roles and the ability to innovate and really create these new services. Because uh, ultimately, oftentimes, now you see here we have a Google Hangout that NASA organizes because NASA does a fantastic job with social media, of course, right down to we're able to have Google Hangouts that bring astronauts into, into schools, into programs, and things like that. But what you might not know is that we actually use this internally to improve the mechanisms of government itself. And so here we have some of our friends, and I say friends, but they're colleagues, which people from different geographic areas across the United States, different, completely different mission areas of public service can get together, have FaceTime, talk, have a cup of coffee, and work together once again to tackle those challenges that we have and create new opportunities. Because ultimately, when we look at technology and we look at the millennial generation, technology, data, public service, it is like a palette that we can use to paint this future that we want to have, this shared social good that we all want to get there to. And there are seemingly limitless opportunities in which we can make those dreams happen. However, in public service, specifically in the federal government, of course, there are some things that we have to take extra care for, uh, that we can do, not do things that sometimes even the private sector can do in regards to securing the privacy of citizens, um, 
like with social media, for instance, we don't delve into personally identifiable information. So when you hear about how marketing companies are able to identify their influencers and find out what they're saying to people, that's actually something we hold back from doing uh, in order to protect the privacy of citizens. Also, security itself can be a grand issue. So once we balance those two things out, it seems like limitless opportunities for young people and millennials to be able to make that government of the 21st century happen. And we'll also, we balance it out with some of these well put in obstacles. And ultimately, what we want to do is, of course, the standard way of doing things before, we must change. We call it disruption. Uh, if that term hasn't already been played out too much, is that we must go in. And it's not just improving or updating the systems we have, it's rethinking them entirely. Um, sometimes technology is the solution. Most of the times, it's never the tech that it's the solution. It's the ideas and the processes and the performance analysis that comes within each person who brings that into the technology itself. Now, one example of this, of how we go a little bit outside of the box is, we have a lot of complex documents in the federal government, contracts, um, regulations, things like that, that we want to make sure is more accessible, available to entrepreneurs, startups, the people who paid for these programs with taxpayer dollars and darn well should be able to receive them where they are. So what we did is we look in, in our field of evaluating all emerging technologies through the internet is we saw Rap Genius. Rap Genius is an annotation wiki that allows people to go in and not change the document itself, but explain the background behind it. The perfect thing if you have a complex regulation that's, for instance, directed at small businesses. So we negotiated a terms of service with and brought the federal government into Rap Genius as well, using the News Genius platform. And so what happened, as you see here, is we're able to now put up complex regulations, policies, things like that, and then specialists are able to go in and in plain language make them more understandable to the people who need them. Now, one of the fun side effects of this, however, is, of course, when we get culturally of how are these innovations received, this, of course, is in the news that I woke up to with Kanye West, and it's, you know, U.S. government moles deal with rap genius. Well, you know, we take what we can get uh, on that, but an interesting thing is, on the day this was released, GSA's obscure policy that regarded and focusing on startups and entrepreneurs became the top most popular hip hop artist on Rap Genius, uh, more popular than Kanye West, Beyonce, and Jay Z. And so the thought is, is that by adopting these things, these things that culturally digital natives come to expect, we're able to change the mechanisms of government to make it more available and accessible to the citizens and the people who need them. How many people have ever walked down the street and thought, if zombies showed up, how would I get out of this situation? Raise your hand. If you're not raising your hand, you're lying. Every, I did it this morning walking in. I was like, okay, if zombies take over this place, how am I getting out of here? It's just, it's just how we do things. Well, so the CDC, they, a couple of years ago, they were like, you know, we need people to think about emergency management. What's, you know, what's their uh, emergency plans? Do they have kits, first aid? And so they put out this nice little blog post on preparation, but in the scheme of zombies. And it became then, for $87, what cost taxpayers $87, this entire thing, ended up getting 3.6 billion impressions um, and came far and away, just almost like a cultural touchstone for public services and emergency management. Some people still, when I say the CDC, they go, the zombie agency, which I'm, you know, once again, we take what we can get and everything, but it's a fantastic, fantastic example of how when you, even working with reduced budgets, when millennials, they bring the creativity, the cultural knowledge to be able to connect with citizens, that it doesn't take large budgets in order to have more effective, more present public services that are more accessible to people. Even the CIA got in it, as uh, people saw recently. Um, <laughs> It's a lot of laughter on that one, which is good, uh, is even the CIA got involved and is now on Twitter and Facebook. And so people just so much responded, hundreds of thousands of follows in an hour, just because it's like the CIA is following our account, 
we started getting thousands of followers just because the CIA was following us, because that became the touchstone that then people used to explore different areas of public service. Though I'll tell you, it's a little bit weird when you wake up to an alert on your phone that you know Roseanne and Spencer Pratt are now following your digital government account. Um, but once again, it's when we use these tools, we're not just using them exactly how the private sector does, we must repurpose them and use them in ways specific to public services. Now, one example that we have now, it's, you know, it's, it's fun and having impressions and retweets and things like that. Something that is, we understand culturally in the wor workspace, but sometimes we have struggles even working with the private sector on this, is that you look, most reality television stars are verified on Twitter or on Facebook. Most government accounts, however, are not. And following a fake celebrity on social media is different than following a fake emergency alert or fake verified information when there's a hurricane, or when you need to know and you want to trust that you are looking up your student loan information, or you're a veteran who needs your medical benefits. Because I promise you there are many fake accounts that exist just to fish and scam millennials using fake social media accounts. So what we did a while ago is built called the Federal Social Media Registry, which is a repository of all official social media accounts in government. We had to take verification in our own hands and make it easier. So once again, while people, it was hard, we were not really getting verification, celebrity culture got balanced out a little bit more, so we thought, okay, we have to come to parity here. We have to find out a solution. So using the API from the registry, uh, which is a data source in order for verification, recently, just two weeks ago, Facebook agreed to now blanket verify all government accounts. And in fact, our team of, this is an office called 18F, if you haven't looked it up at GSA, um, a fantastic team of young disruptors who used to, a lot of them used to be presidential innovation fellows. They created this solution and Facebook with one click was able to download a file and in a couple or few hours verify over 1,200 government accounts. Now that's something where once again, the millennial culture and the output, we were able to make the process easier for Facebook. So it became, they had to at that point go because it's important to us, of course, to ensure that public services are verified and that people can trust when they need it, that that's who they're talking to. And so now of course we have Facebook blanket and this has ramifications now, not just for us, because we've had now state and local governments be like, why not us? We've had the World Bank go, well, why not us? This is the beginning of change that we talk about, where it seems like small things, but small things can make a big impact. And this is now something that we can do with any social media platform that is out there. Uh, so look for more on this. Um, another thing, I mean, these people are absolutely wonderful. When we talk about federal student loans, because most millennials are gonna have student loans, there are teams of young people who are going and using social media are able to answer over 150 questions an hour and basically are demolishing the old model of having to sit and wait on a phone call for three hours or send an email and it gets queued up. This is more widespread, more instantaneous. You can verify now and you know you're actually talking to the people you want to talk to and they have used social media to basically to create a customer service powerhouse in both English and Spanish. Uh, and so if you ever want to check out Federal Student Aid, they are a wonderful example of a millennial team that is just absolutely creating a new model for services in government. Now the next big thing is, if, you, if your cultural hero is Elon Musk, we have a home for you. Because by far, the most exciting, tantalizing, next generation, next frontier for public services is the Internet of Things and wearable devices and things like that. I'm hoping to work myself out of a job, and I always say that the future of digital engagement or even the near future is not me sitting on a computer chatting with somebody who's sitting at a computer. It's using that data and opening up data in government and making it responsive where your alerts come through your car. It comes through your home devices. It comes through your wearable watches and things like that. The future of public services is location-based. It's triggered to exactly where you are. This is things that we can already do now, but this is the opportunity now where we need to work with the private sector. We need to identify where are the needs because we are going there together. Also, while we're racing to embrace these emerging technologies that seem limitless, one of the things that we know and is an underpinning is that many of these tools are not designed in such a way always that are accessible to persons with disabilities. 
Now, when the president said during Hurricane Sandy, if the power goes out, go to social media for your emergency information, that works only if the information is available and usable by the very citizens who often need it the most. And that's why we champion now working with the private sector, flying people out to the valley to be able to teach them more about the importance and the need for accessibility in these programs. Um, maybe that's going to be through wearable devices more. Perhaps that's breaking down data and making it more citizen-centric delivery of it. We don't know exactly, which is why we invite you to work with us on this. But this is the type of thing that you don't often hear about. But now it makes sense a little bit, I hope, because when you talk about persons with disabilities, it's not just the vision impaired, it's not just the hearing impaired, it's the aging population, it's wounded warriors. All of us know people that at some extent have a need around accessibility. And these are one of the things that culturally we must approach and it is always in our hearts when we are looking at these jobs. So ultimately, when we look at these opportunities, vast, uh, the internet of things, when we look at the challenges that we have around accessibility data, we have a mantra that we have in this social gov community of ours, which once again extends beyond to all government agencies and also our work internationally. We say in the words of Polar Explorer, Lieutenant Robert Peary, we shall find a way or make one. And perhaps traditionally back there was things of our government agencies working together. Are we meaningfully sharing? Are we just spinning wheels? Today, through the millennial culture, through emerging technologies and digital government, now more than ever, we are able to work together and make public-private partnerships in order to tackle our greatest challenges that we face. And we don't take no for an answer. Not from other people, not from ourselves, because uh, Ghostbusters, who's seen Ghostbusters? More people seen Ghostbusters than ever thought about zombies? I don't know about that. Uh, but you say, we've got the tools, we've got the talent. And that's the thing, the millennial generation, digital natives have the expectation that we are working together on these things. So that's why we invite you, any of you, to please think about what role that could play, because we're, we are waiting for you, and we hope to reach out to you soon. Thank you very much, and I, I think we're ready for the Q&A. Great job. Thank you, sir. Um, so I guess uh, my first question is uh, maybe anec anecdotal, but you know, you're know, you talking a lot about sort of uh, the social media stuff and, and sort of getting government uh, to be more digitally native, I guess. Yeah. What is it like when you go into these meetings with these sort of, uh, with the bureaucrats? Um, and, and what, are they excited about it? Are people asking you to come help them or are you sort of pushing them into the future? Someone even asked me this uh, last evening, uh, is how do you change, so when people think about government bureaucracy, they think of this unmovable stone and how are you able to do these innovative things against that system? And what it comes down to it is that, once again, we drive home that it either has to measurably improve services or measurably reduce costs. So a lot of times when we look at the way these tools might be used in other sectors, it's buzz, it's things like that. By putting in performance analysis, that convinces senior leaders and there's a sobriety to it, but also it frees us because once we're actually like, okay, here's the anchor, we have a responsibility as public servants to have accountability and transparency. Um, that's how I even got into this, is uh, supporting open government initiatives, which is to create a responsive, transparent, and countable government um, in part through the use of technology. And I find that it's actually quite freeing in a sense uh, when, you, when you approach it that way. And we're on the winning team. I mean, it's, it just gets better. And so, I mean, it's good. All right, here's a follow-up <laughs> question from the audience. Um, what are, which I imagine happens a lot in government, what are ways that boomers can embrace millennials and millennials' passions or help cultivate them instead of fearing sort of being taken over and, and pushed out by millennials? We've seen it all. And I'll tell you, and especially our experiences, is it's not an age thing. There are boomers who do just do an absolutely fantastic job and are the mentors of the millennials um, in this sense. Uh, and so definitely the boomers, they're not right now currently in a lot of those leadership positions. 
And we see less and less the gut reaction of let's not do this because of fear of the unknown or something like that. We're really trying to embrace the culture of, I mean, there's a poster in office, you know, break things fast uh, and, and move forward on it. And that's really what we're trying to espouse. Um, let's take another one from the audience. Uh, you, you mentioned a little about sort of uh, the sort of opportunities for millennials to work in the government. Yes. Um, but with most companies seeking millennials for their workforces, sort of how does the government compete with that to get them? Well, I'll tell you, uh, studies show that uh, the government is one of the top three fields that people identify um, when they're coming out of college of what they'd like to work in. I'll tell you, we know that there's a challenge with the hiring processes and things like that. I mean, it was painful for me applying for my job. Um, but those are the one of the things we're improving right now. And that's what we would say to anybody, is that whether through the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program, um, 18F, GSA, there are more job openings now um, in digital government um, than I've seen before. Um, and it's ripe with opportunity. In fact, I, the challenge is now, I think, shifted from in government having trouble getting resources to have these roles open, and now just finding enough quality candidates. Um, like I said, so the, the, the positions are open, the need is there. We need people to know that need, and you know, like I said, have that entrepreneurial spirit and bring that into public service. Um, so you talked a lot, you did a lot of great examples about um, sort of digital government and, and like where it's working. Where do, you think it's, where do you think it's not working, and sort of where, where do you think it can go and, and get better, and what is preventing you from doing that? Well, what we so when we started the, the social gov community, we didn't do it based on job position. We based it on if you care, if you have a need, if you are going to see this through and you're gonna be a driving force, I don't care what your grade is, what your role is, we want you in this team because now we get to work together collectively um, in order to drive change. And so there's some agencies that have like 80 people in the community, some not, and we work together. One person runs into a roadblock, we have two of their sister organizations contact them and quickly able to say, this is how we did it, this is the performance behind it. And so that's the thing is, once you build these digital communities, you're really, no one is alone. We always say that, no one is a one person shop when we're all working through this together. Uh, here's a great one from the audience. Uh, it seems like the most obvious use of social media and internet is to engage citizens on legislation and the legislative process. This is obviously not your branch of government, but hopefully you'll have okay. something That's to say. Okay. When and how will the government create transparency in the le legislative process using digital technology? This is a, not to get out of my lane or anything, but just speaking in government in a whole, is that that is exactly the type of thing that we're moving into for transparency. It's not just social media, it's not just social data. If you go to data.gov, um, these are things where we're trying to open up the data of government. It's like how many people have ever used, um, gone, okay, how do you check your weather on your phone? I go to the weather app. Okay, your weather app. Some people go to CNN. <laughs> Other people listen to the radio. All of that, all the services that everybody uses, all comes from the National Weather Service data. So what they do is they put out the data and then other people are able to pr create better services and people take it for granted that they're using a government service. And we're now approaching where we can have that model for any of our public services. Any agency is able to open up that way. And so it's, like I said, it's an incredibly exciting time thinking that that one model could extend anywhere. Uh, and it will. It's an inevitability at this point. Uh, you talked a little about sort of the, the reason where Facebook verified all the um, government agencies. They made it seem really easy. <laughs> uh, so I guess my question <laughs> is, what is, what are your interactions like with these companies? Sort of how willing are they to help you? How sort of collaborative and or antagonistic is well, it? It's, it, well with anything, it's like when people think about the federal government, they think of this monolithic one thing, this Which block. is you, it's you. And, but it's people. I mean, the government is, is people, it's you know, your family members and things like that. That's the same with working with tools, is that when we're working with these emerging technologies, um, one month they might not be ready in their development cycle to take it to this level. Then all of a sudden, six months later, they'll approach you about it. 
And so that's what we try to do, uh, especially through my office, is maintain relations, constant evaluation processes, so that when different emerging technologies are ready to take it to that level, that we're ready and to show them how, and we're very open to working with them. In fact, if anybody is a startup or an entrepreneur and has a service that you would like, you know, something like State Department or NASA to use or something like that, that is something that is possible. Uh, Let's just ask, I, I know you don't want to talk about it too much, but how did the CIA, I mean, the CIA, that CIA tweet, insanely popular, also hilarious, how did that, how did that come about? And uh, they're delightful people. Right, I mean, clearly. Uh, I, yeah. No, 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 <laughs> I, I, I absolutely promise you, they, they are a, a, an exceptionally delightful people. And I, and I think it, it just speaks to anything where, I mean, all agencies, to some extent, are using social media in the federal government. Um, so we say break it down into three ways, They're either sharing, listening, or engaging. Um, and we believe, like we always say, to get social media out of the comm shop and implant it in the program level because any agency, any office could stand to listen and be like, how are these programs performing? What's the needs of my community? Things like that. No matter what you're doing, there are measurable ways in which you can better use these tools, um, either through transparency, um, as far as, like I said, just gaining information about what, you know, what are the people like that you're trying to create better programs for? Um, and what that'll happen is increasingly as we break things and can quickly repair them, is you won't see like, you know, larger monolithic programs come out that are, you know, doomed to fail in that sense, that you're able to quickly identify how it's performing, what the needs are, and we have better targeted uh, public services. And hopefully this is something, like I said, that doesn't just stay in the federal government, but this approach is something that you see any other, other nations, the World Bank, when we work with the um, nonprofits and things like that. It's, I cannot say more how exciting of a time it is. I wish I could sleep less, is, is the whole big thing. Great, all right, we are out of time. All Thank right. you, Justin. Thank you very much. Come.